Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for this evening's presentation. Uh, many of you al already know me. I'm Ken Miller, uh, Associate Professor of History here at Washington College. Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to Adam Goodhart, Michael Buckley, and the CV Star Center for generously arranging, organizing, and sponsoring uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, Professor McCleskey's visit simply would not have been possible without their generous support. And I take great pleasure in introducing tonight's speaker. Turk McCleskey is Professor of History at the Virginia Military Institute where he teaches courses on colonial and revolutionary North America, Native American history, and African American history. In 1999, he received the VMI Foundation's Award for Distinguished Teaching. Professor McCleskey's scholarship focuses on the 18th century colonial American frontier. He's held fellowships from the American Historical Association, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, and the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and Public Policy. He's published in a range of academic journals, including Pennsylvania History, uh, the Virginia Magazine of History and Biography, and the Journal of Interdisciplinary History. In the summer of 2014, Professor McCleskey produced his first book, The Road to Black Ned's Forge, a story of race, sex, and trade on the colonial American frontier. Published by the University of Virginia Press, the book was named a choice outstanding academic title for 2014 and received the Richard Slatton Award from the Virginia Historical Society. The subject of tonight's presentation, the book is met with considerable praise. As one historian notes, with keen insight and thorough research, Turk McCleskey vividly recovers the frontier world of Black Ned. Bold, proud, and clever, Black Ned lived at a crossroads in Simon Place. On Virginia's colonial frontier, a forceful black man could prosper as a blacksmith, defend his freedom in court, and marry a white woman. But that defiance eventually provoked resentments that during the next generation would close loopholes in the system of racial slavery, gaps that Ned had exploited so resourcefully. McCleskey has worked wonders in recovering and retelling Ned's powerful story. Virtually unknown in the annals of American history, Ned Tarr and the story of his life are a remarkable discovery, writes another historian. With notable skill, deft handling of complex sources, and masterly writing, McCleskey places Tarr at the center of a major work of early American history. It really is a, a fascinating story, and it's a truly wonderful book. Uh, so I'm especially pleased to note that uh, we'll conclude tonight's event with a book signing, and I'm sure Professor McCleskey would be only too happy to sign your copy. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him with us here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Professor Turk McCleskey. Uh, thank you. That was a very generous introduction, and um, it, it's, it's also a little bit ambitious because now I've got to live up to some, some pretty high praise there, um, uh, which is just, you know, might make me nervous. The, um, the, the CV Star Center has really um, done me a great tribute in, in, uh, in bringing me in here this evening. I, I thank you very much, Adam, for that. And it is a real pleasure to be uh, here and to get a chance to interact with some of the students in the uh, American Studies and the History Department. Um, and especially to have the chance to discuss with you uh, the, um, uh, or one of the 18th century Virginias, because of course there were many 18th century Virginias. There's an urban version that's very familiar to everybody who ever was dragged th through a, a junior high tour of Colonial Williamsburg. Um, that urban version of Virginia is still discernible in towns like Alexandria or Fredericksburg uh, or Yorktown, um, certainly. There's a genteel planter version, and of course at Washington College, uh, I think the ideal example of that is at Mount Vernon. Um, of what uh, a, a fine gentry Virginia uh, might look like, and of course other historic sites uh, as well. 
There's a religious Virginia that we can observe in places like uh, the church where Washington um, worshiped at Christ Church Alexandria, uh, or in Williamsburg at Bruton Parish Church, uh, both of these still active of today Episcopal churches, any number of other Anglican parish churches scattered across the, the Virginia countryside, and a handful of dissenting meeting houses, uh, mostly Presbyterian or Baptist. And let's don't forget the political and economic Virginias that we can see in, in uh, reconstructed in things like the colonial capital at Williamsburg or the governor's. There's also Washington's Virginia in a different sense, and that's uh, a little bit more imperial. And students of Washington, I think very early, acquire a, a um, expansive view of him uh, a kind of continental view of his Virginia. And those landmarks are much larger and scattered far across the American landscape. They become more complex also the farther west we go. Some of them are still architectural. There's Washington's office out in Winchester, Virginia. Um, and the streets and blocks themselves of downtown Winchester are Washington's, you know, contemporary to Washington's day. There's also the modern recreation, the scruffy little Fort Necessity up in Pennsylvania. You have to really want to get there, students. <laughs> you have to really want to go there. But you can tie it to a visit to Falling Water, uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright House, and kind of justify the trip. But these are architectural. There's one more architectural landmark of Washington's Virginia, and that's the, the footprint of Fort Duquesne that you can see uh, from uh, the uh, far side of the Monongahela River, looking down on it uh, from above, and you can see the modern 21st century skyline of Pittsburgh behind it. This, this too is a stunning view. And you see this little tiny footprint of what once was a critical landmark in North America. But in the West, most of the landmarks of Washington's Virginia are landscape not architectural. And in some ways, we feel more bound to, to, more closely connected to Washington's Virginia by the grandeur of the landscape. So the towns of his day, like Winchester and Stanton, Virginia, they're surrounded by, by uh, mountains. And there's this incredibly rough terrain between them and the Ohio River, the Allegheny Plateau, where to cross a creek on a cold day is to take your life in your hands. And intriguingly, it's in the landscape of Washington's Virginia that we also glimpse the lives that Washington shared that landscape with. Looking backward from a modern perspective, we sometimes are surprised by just how complicated those lives um, could be and the vistas that they commanded could be. And notably, Washington's Virginia was racially complex. And not all whites were free, not all blacks were slaved, enslaved. Two centuries after the fact, this seemed to be kind of intriguing to um, a, a man, uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, a biographer of Washington, who's 1948, uh, biography mentioned an interracial marriage that in uh, Freeman's own day in 1948 would have been illegal in Virginia. And Freeman, of course, was writing late in the era of Jim Crow, the period during which racial segregation uh, was enforced by law, and implicitly at least, he seems to have recognized that uh, Washington's Virginia was racially uh, just more puzzling uh, than uh, his own Virginia. His own Virginia, of course, uh, had a pretty simple story, it seemed. And um, that, that story, as it was presented in the colonial landmarks of the mid-20th century, um, was really different from what you get today. Some of you in this room can remember, as I do, when very few black faces appeared in public history sites, uh, to include Mount Vernon. At Monticello, for example, uh, the first time I went there, uh, there was a, an anonymous servant received a kind of cameo appearance in the dining room 
uh, at, at which it was sort of emphasized how mostly there weren't servants there, never mind how the food got prepared and magically appeared uh, for Thomas Jefferson's amazed guest. That's a very far cry from today when the tour guides today uh, discuss Sally Hemings in her master's bedchamber. It's also unlike my first visit to Mount Vernon, which was on a brutally hot uh, day in the summer of the bicentennial year. And now the site, uh, the site's interpretation includes not just the presence of slaves, but uh, the identities of them worked into the, the large narrative and the uh, large interpretation program for the whole uh, of Mount Vernon. In other words, we're witnessing the reappearance of another Virginia, a Virginia that would have been familiar, um, and the landmarks like Washington's Mount Vernon play a critical part in our understanding that um, new, view, new view of Virginia. But it's important to recognize that African-American colonial Virginia includes more than the landmarks of slavery. There also are Virginia landmarks for free blacks, like the road to Black Dance Forge. Today, we call that road by its um, 20th century name. I, I, you know, I drove a piece of it to get here. It's inter Interstate 81, uh, Highway 11 is, uh, US Highway 11 is probably a little closer to the colonial trace of it. But you may also know it in its 19th century version as the Valley Pike, which played a prominent role in the Civil War. You may know it in its 18th century uh, name as the Wagon Road or Great Wagon Road connecting Pennsylvania and the Carolinas. And early in its history, as shown in the Fry Jefferson map, it's also referred to as the Indian Road or the Warrior's Road. So it predates the European arrival uh, in uh, Virginia. Freeman, um, uh, gives us this, this footnote that kind of thus gives us a place to start in exploring free black colonial Virginia, at least west of the Blue Ridge, and that's, a, that's it with a diary kept by a party of Moravian ministers. In October of 1753, uh, these ministers journeyed along the Great Wagon Road uh, from Pennsylvania to what became Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And that route led them up the Valley of Virginia, uh, west of the Blue Ridge, and about five miles north of modern-day Lexington, where I live and work, the ministers met an African-American blacksmith, and they asked him to shoe one of their horses. The blacksmith really impressed these Moravians, um, who were themselves um, uh, pious people and German-speaking uh, German people. Uh, they described him as a free man. They wrote more about him in their travel diary than anybody else they encountered on this 500-mile-long journey. And in part, they appreciated that this blacksmith was a man of faith. He and his wife told the ministers they had heard Moravian, uh, Moravians preach in Pennsylvania, and they, uh, I'm quoting, loved people who spoke of the Savior. Now, that's an interesting statement because in Pennsylvania, Moravian preaching sometimes took place in a very reverential uh, uh, form, and sometimes uh, you go to hear a sermon and a boxing match breaks out, uh, because basically uh, there's a fair amount of rioting from time to time as uh, Lutherans and German Reformed uh, uh, congregants and ministers especially uh, seemed, wanted to resist these Moravian incursions. So um, it, it's an interesting statement that, 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 that Ned was there uh, with them. Um, indeed, the, the couple also owned a book of sermons that was by the uh, spiritual leader of the Moravians in this period, the patron, in fact, of the Moravian church. So the ministers appreciated uh, that. They also appreciated the uh, Smith's hospitality uh, because the next morning, uh, his wife, the blacksmith's wife, uh, baked bread for the ministers, which if you think about the rigors of traveling in colonial America, would have been an incredible treat uh, for the uh, travelers. Beyond their faith and their kindness, though, the, the couple 
were distinctive in some other ways. Um, the African-American husband understood German well, this from native German speakers. And as Freeman noted, the husband was black and the wife was white. Having broken bread together uh, the that morning, the ministers took their leave uh, of the couple and they resumed their journey, um, fording the Mari River and departing on for Carolina. Now that's quite a record, if you think about it. Um, quite a number of really evocative little descriptions in there. But um, historians have an insatiable appetite for detail, and um, the, everybody who's a historian in this room knows this to be true. We never get enough information. And it um, was especially frustrating for me because the Moravian record didn't name this person, this remarkable person. And I don't remember when I realized that the Moravian's blacksmith was a man who appeared in other records as Black Ned the blacksmith and appeared as, in still other records as the man named Edward Tarr with no racial identification whatsoever. But somewhere in the late 1980s as I was winding up my dissertation, I sort of realized, okay, that's it. No music, no fanfare, no, you know, <laughs> no sense that this, uh, this particular very intriguing guy was about to drag me down a, a very long road to Black Ned's Forge. Um, but I began to get interested in him as a possible uh, subject for initially in just an essay. I began to kind of c collect and, and build a file on him. And um, over time, as, as he kept kind of piquing my curiosity, you know, it just, just keep feeding me one more document that kind of brought me along a little deeper in the story. And eventually, I followed him back to Pennsylvania. And he can be glimpsed there first in 1732 on the banks of the Schuylkill River. This is a detail from that same map. And the Schuylkill, uh, if, you, if you know Philadelphia, it, it runs right through what today is downtown Philadelphia, the train out of uh, Penn Station there that runs north toward New York, runs along it for a spell, and you can actually see across the river to the site of it is Fairmont Park, uh, which uh, it today has a house that's late 18th century built on the site where we first glimpsed Ned at the headwaters, or the, excuse me, the head of navigation of the Schuylkill. And it's there that we see him first on the, on the uh, banks uh, at about the age of 21, enslaved. And he labored as a hammer man in uh, an iron making forge in southeastern Pennsylvania uh, until 1748. This is incredibly dangerous work. Um, these hammer men were involved in turning pig iron, the, the, uh, the basic form of iron, into something that could be worked into bars, into actually marketable bars. And to do that involved taking these big, chunks that might be as heavy as 100 pounds each and melting two or three together and then taking this big mass of red hot iron weighing two or 300 pounds and two guys would pick this up with tongs and hold it under a water powered trip hammer that would beat on that mass of iron and essentially you, you think of the iron itself as a sponge and the liquid that's being beaten out of the iron, squeezed out of the sponge is the impurities. These impurities, you understand, are basically silica, which for the geologist, you understand, is sand. It's like molten Coke bottles spattering out of, the, out of these, these uh, big, huge hunks of red-hot iron. So this is a very different kind of slavery, right, than, than what we think of in Washington's Virginia, even though we know that in Washington's Virginia, a short distance from Mount Vernon, slaves were working ironworking as well. So there's a, there, there's a very interesting application of, uh, of enslaved labor and tar's right at the heart of it. And um, gradually, and I, I think this was one of the biggest challenges of the book, gradually I figured out that if you want to understand what he was learning in this incredible school, this kind of university of fire, 
or uh, around the ironworks of Pennsylvania, you have to know what the masters are doing too. And, and this conceptually, it, it means that the, the masters and the slaves are literally shackled together. The, to, for the historian who's trying to investigate the one, you can't do it without the other. The, their stories are inextricable. And from that time in the ironworks, Ned seems to have drawn these incredible lessons about how to get by um, and uh, make it in the world. And when his last master, Thomas Shute, uh, died in 1748, um, Tar seized this life-changing opportunity that Shute's will provided. The will disposed of six slaves. This is a very large number for Pennsylvania masters. Um, and one of them, a female, was assigned to an heir. Uh, a second, an elderly man, was to be cared for by another heir. Um, a third was be, to be sold for the best price that can be got, which that's instructive, right? That means this is not a deathbed epiphany where the guy's saying, oh, I should never have had slaves, right? So, and then the final three, the final three, including Ned, were given the opportunity to buy their own freedom on a six-year installment plan. Ned made his last payment in half the time. At the age of 37, he was free. At first glance, Ned's next move is really counterintuitive because he went to Virginia. <laughs> This is fun doing in Maryland, by the way, you know, because <laughs> you get that on more than one level. The, um, the, there's, here we're sort of constrained by where we're, uh, our own perspective. You know, we, we look back on Ned's time through this giant lens of the Civil War um, and, and the, the late um, antebellum period. And so, so everything that we see of slavery is, is in some way tinted or warped or bent by, by that experience. Um, but in fact, um, it's important to remember that before the American Revolution, slavery was legal in every colony in North America and um, existed in every colony, not just legal. And uh, as I argue in the book, what Ned was actually doing in moving to Virginia is um, moving for love. Remember that white woman, the wife that the Moravians identified? Um, interracial marriage was illegal in Pennsylvania and in colonial Virginia. Both colonies had um, quite strict penalties. In fact, the Pennsylvania penalties were more severe than in Virginia. But what was illegal was the act of marriage, not the condition. And you think about that for a minute and you go, if I can just get the, a minister to do this in Pennsylvania and go somewhere else, I can't be prosecuted. The wife can't be either. She too is at risk of, of a very severe penalty. So the marriage appears to have been facilitated by a radical Presbyterian minister uh, who, um, as it happens, <laughs> has, uh, uh, his resume includes uh, precipitating uh, the Great Awakening uh, crisis in the Presbyterian church in, in the early 1740s. So it's a, it's, this is a complicated story, far more than I ought to open up tonight, but he, um, worked for a time in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Lan Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, before moving to Virginia, uh, arriving in um, where, in this vicinity of the Upper James River, uh, right where Edward Tar lands, and they show up in the documentary record within just a couple of weeks of each other. Now, this place where they located is a giant tract of land that was granted uh, in, initially in late 1730s to a speculator from New Jersey uh, named Benjamin Borden. And Borden's uh, agents and uh, heirs divided the land, they sold it, and when we look uh, at it, uh, we find that that's exactly where Ned and a whole lot of other people from Pennsylvania wound up. In 1753, Ned uh, signed his name as Edward Tarr, 
uh, on a pledge to pay a Presbyterian minister at the Timber Ridge Meeting House. Uh, Edward Tarr also signed the call, which is basically the petition to the minister to come uh, serve as the full-time uh, pastor of that congregation. Uh, this meeting house still stands, it's still an active congregation. Um, a, the very heart of the building, which is stone, might actually be from Edward Tarr's period. Uh, we're not sure. But what we've got in this neighborhood is an incredibly white, Scotch-Irish, Presbyterian bunch of people and one black guy married to a white woman. And yet, here he is on the busiest road in Virginia and everybody's okay with it. In 1754, he bought the, the 270-acre farm that's depicted in this 1804 map, uh, where he's shown here as E.D.W. Tarr. And that made him the first free black landowner west of the Blue Ridge. His blacksmith shop, his forge, became a prominent landmark for um, residents, but for travelers too. Um, and he made it look so easy. He's got this economic success, his interracial marriage, full membership in a Presbyterian congregation. And I'm here to tell you that is not easy in itself. Acceptance by white neighbors, this is a really different colonial Virginia, right? No wonder Freeman couldn't resist plugging that into his 1948 biography of Washington, even though it had nothing to do with Washington. It's just irresistible. And you look at all of this and you think, what could possibly go wrong? And of course, it was another white woman. Contemporaries described the second woman as Ned Tarr's concubine, which is a term we should take in its Old Testament sense of a junior or subordinate wife. In other words, wife number one is still there. Okay. Around 1760, Tar and both women moved to a new smithy that he set up in Stanton, the county seat. And that's where we find them the following year, and that, in fact, is where the book starts. And I want to close with the first three paragraphs from that to help you understand some of the challenges that might come at a man like this. In the autumn of 1761, a hamlet surrounding Augusta County's courthouse officially became Stanton, the westernmost town in colonial Virginia. By contemporary standards, it was a diminutive village in a frontier county. And residents faced a long road to any substantial town. 150 miles to Virginia's capital in Williamsburg, 300 miles to Pennsylvania's capital in Philadelphia, over 400 miles to South Carolina's capital in Charleston. For Stanton resident Edward Tarr, however, Philadelphia and Charleston loomed claustrophobically close that fall. On 6 October, Edward Tarr and a North Carolina white man named Hugh Montgomery stood before two justices of the peace in Stanton. Montgomery complained that he had purchased a Negro man named Edward Tarr from one Joseph Chute of Charleston, son of the late Thomas Chute, to whom the said Edward belonged to in the province of Pennsylvania. Tarr denied Montgomery's ownership claim, asserting instead that he had bought himself from Thomas Schutz's executor and grandson, William Davis of Philadelphia. As the magistrates weighed Montgomery's complaint, they reviewed more than a set of documents. They also explicitly considered their firsthand knowledge of Tarr's larger story. Tarr, they noted, 
has resided in this county for 10 years last past and is a freeholder. The magistrates hesitated to enslave someone they had known for a decade as a free and economically independent man. Well, uh, the rest of Edward Tarr's story is in his book. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Um, <laughs> I'd be delighted to answer questions. This, this and, and I should say that I expect to because this material is deliberately provocative uh, as a way to kind of think about the, uh, the way that we define term, uh, racial identities and the way that those racial identities are to some extent malleable can be shaped by the participants in those individual systems. So here's the chance, students, here's the chance for you to show you know, what a great education you're getting and really make all your professors really, really proud of you. <laughs> Which we live for, by the way. Be patient, Ken. There we go. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, right, right. No, uh, it varied from state to state. That's all within state control, but it was definitely illegal in Virginia. Um, no, the you're you're right about the Scotch Irish. These are my people. I can do this. Uh, I can I can do some. They're pugnacious. We are. Um, they were, they were, however, really empowered by their position on the Virginia frontier. And they, acting in the name of the king, right up to the moment of the revolution, they were, they were doing a great job of building a whole brand new society that they were in charge of. So I wouldn't say that they had moved out there to be away from the king or, to, or that they even really thought about independence at all until the crisis begins to unfold in the 1760s. The, I think what's maybe more important though is this part of their identity, this Presbyterian identity, and, and that is that, that several of the people in the immediate neighborhood, the, the, the tar, TAR's immediate neighborhood, several of those people had been in Pennsylvania very close to uh, one of the copper mines belonging to Tar's last master. And so there's, a, there's every chance that they all knew each other. Um, and that if Tar's interest in religion is leading him to go hear these Moravian ministers, then it's also gonna bring him to hear a firebrand like this minister that, that these guys uh, were uh, part of his congregation of and that, and that, well, the grammar just went to pieces on that, sorry. The, that, that they, they're from there, they, they know each other already. So he's moving into a neighborhood where they may have known him as a slave, but they also know him to be a pious member of the congregation. And he's essentially, he's being sponsored by this minister who, who of all of them, certainly is the most anti-royal, uh, and anti-authoritarian. You what? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All this property and everything that he's worked for, you know, money, businesses, uh, would the slave master have the right to everything he's earned, or would that be his wife or his wife get another Virginia? That's, uh, if everybody, you might not have heard the question, I'm going to repeat it just briefly. But the question summarized is if he had been re enslaved, what would happen to his property, including the real property? but also the personal property of you know, his tools, uh, the, the stock in the shop and all of it. So um, what you've just laid out would be one of those um, chancery court cases that would drag on for years and years and years because, because that, that actually is legally is an incredibly complicated problem. And you can bet that somebody would have said, no, wait a minute, for one reason or another, um, including maybe Tar himself, he, he litigated he sued a guy and won, um, and he defended um, several, t a number of times in uh, debt litigation against himself. So he's very conversant with the legal system. Um, so 
rather than try to draw out the, the legal map of that, let's just say that that would have been an amazingly wonderful, rich, revealing lawsuit. And uh, at one level, I'm almost sorry it didn't happen. But at another level, it worked out okay for Ned. So, yeah, good question. Yes, sir. He's obviously a, a, a clever man. Yeah. And I'm just sort of curious about his education and the way that he acquired it. Well, um, that's one of, that was one of the fun things to try to work out in the, in the book, uh, and there's a section on that, um, because there are documents survive in his hand, um, so he's literate. Uh, the Germans said that he's got this, the book of sermons, but that doesn't mean he could read German, because that particular book was, had gone through at least two uh, American printings in English, uh, so it had been translated out of the original German. But pretty clearly he's literate because we got documents that he signed. Uh, and that, and uh, so a promissory note, uh, an account of a blacksmith work that he had done. So he's able, he's numerate, not just literate. He, he's able to do the bookkeeping in a way that is absolutely indistinguishable from uh, the way that, that an artisan would keep the book, a white artisan would keep the books. In other words, there's just, there, if, you, if all you had was a documentary record, and you saw this signature, Edward Tarr, you, there would be nothing about it that made you think, oh, this guy's a free black. It's, it's just not there. So it looks like the education uh, part of it came out of this ironworking context where um, that, you know, as I described it, that's a world of fire, but it's also a world of paper because um, that's, that, that industry just generated a huge volume of records. Uh, they survive, m many of those survive in, in the collections of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And so um, e even a slave had a stake in the, in the bookkeeping because slaves are participating in ironworks economies uh, for pay as well as for their master's credit. In other words, their slaves may be bringing in uh, things like making brooms or baskets or that they can sell on their own, or they bring in produce, uh, eggs, chickens, things like that. So, so they've got a stake in it. They understand very well how the documentary record works, and then uh, one way or the other, they learn how to, how to read, how to write, and how to cipher, how to keep, keep books. So. Yes, sir. Well, um, part of what this book is about is the changing, uh, let me repeat that question. What, this, this tells us something, the book tells us something about race relations in Pennsylvania, but what does it also reveal about changing race relations in Virginia? And, and that part of it is, I think, I feel like is one of the things that I, um, that I brought, one of the most substantial things that I brought to the scholarly conversation about race in colonial America, uh, and that is how does it get set up in this new, very rapidly growing frontier community with people from uh, Ulster uh, or from you know, German-speaking parts of Europe who, who have no background in slavery, and yet within a generation, they do move into it. And so um, I, think, I think that pretty clearly there there's a period here where the rules are in flux. But what's intriguing is it's not unique. To, it's not just this one weird community west of the Blue Ridge. If you look closely, you can see that period of transition in every colony. Even in South Carolina, they're, they're, which is you know, deeply, intensely committed to slavery from its origins, uh, even in South Carolina, the um, there's, there's this interesting period here in the 1700s before the revolution when uh, free people of color are able to, to carve out a certain amount of an independent living that then gets suppressed later. So it's a, there's a, you, you, one way to envision it is that in this long, long dialogue about race relations in the United States, 
it really is a dialogue. It's a push and a pull back and forth with um, actors shaping the outcomes from both sides or from every side of the, of the equation. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, okay, so let me show you. Yeah, the question is, does any material culture, especially archaeology, survive? And the answer is no, and here's why. Um, the, um, this tract, outlined in yellow and blue, is Tar's land as it exists on the modern real estate tax map. Interchange 195 on Interstate 81 is right in the middle of it. <laughs> and so in the 1950s, long before anybody was paying attention to the weird stuff that bulldozers were kicking up, whatever was there got wiped out. This is a, this is a heavily commercialized site, been really, really worked over. So um, all I can, the only way I make that right with myself is say, I just, I just didn't know and I couldn't, I couldn't have done anything about it. It's not my fault. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Do you have any um, history on the wife? Oh, that woman. I've chased that woman harder than any, any real woman in my whole life. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't find her. I, I mean, it's just, it, oh, it's enraging. I, the other one, the concubine, yeah, I got a little bit on her. But the, <laughs> but the, the problem was that she was never named. And so I had nothing to go off of. And I mean, I, at the end of my life, I'm going to want the time back I spent pawing through records up in Pennsylvania trying to find her. I mean, it's it, it just, I couldn't find her. Uh, nor could I find any evidence of children. Um, the, unfortunately, the baptismal records for this, the period when they were here, uh, burned in a house fire. Uh, and so the, the documents don't survive that might show. But he, you know, he would have been in his 40s by the time he moved here. And so, you know, the, the, if they'd had children, they might have been in Pennsylvania, but not everybody has kids. And if they had them, it's also possible that they passed. Uh, this, if you're not familiar, this is a term for, for where uh, somebody of mixed, uh, partly African, partly European ancestry, uh, eventually just sort of says, well, I'm going to go somewhere else and just be white. And they redefine themselves in that way. So that's possible also. But the, um, no, <laughs> unfortunately, no. No, no, I mean, ooh, I'd love to add more. Well, the other, the other thought I thought was, could he have been white or skinned? No. Um, the, that's what's interesting. Uh, the, the, the terminology these days, they, they sort of use, it's a, it's, there, there's, there are two terms, um, one black and the other mulatto that appear as racial identifiers over and over. And um, he is always black men. And <clears throat> that, he's also very unusual in that um, most of the free blacks of Virginia by this time are the product of either historical lineages of free black families or uh, the, the immediate child of a white mother, a free mother. Um, so, uh, no, I think, I think pretty clearly his skin color w was being identified so consistently that I think he must have been uh, dark skinned. Yes. Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the question was, uh, is there any chance any ironwork survives in this original church? And unfortunately, no. Um, what I'd rather have than the ironwork would be uh, a piece of timber with the edge on it, because we could do dendrochronology on that. Um, but no such luck. So what you got is stone, and uh, there's just nothing in that that, the, that, you can, that you can do a kind of chemical analysis on and get you back to to a verifiable, yeah, here's the... There's a lot. Uh, the, the markers are mostly replacements for the ones that were contemporaneous to, to TAR. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of unmarked sites in there too, which is not unusual for the time. And people put, use wooden markers and they eventually rotted and so. Yeah. Yes, sir. How prosperous was he? 
Uh, no record of his owning a slave. The last glimpse we get of him, which is in trouble with yet another white woman, uh, he had quite a lot of cash. I mean, and, and we're talking about hard money, gold and silver coin, not just paper. So um, he seems to have done very well. He seems to have managed very well. Um, he's, when he sold the land, he, it took a loss, but you think about everything that could happen to a place over the years, and, uh, and so I, I think that's not necessarily uh, indicative of his overall management. I mean, uh, if he, he moved, we know that he moved away, um, it went to Stanton. If he rented the place or if it simply burned, which you know, certainly is a risk for a, a forge, um, if, the, if the buildings burned, then the value of the property really would have dropped. So it's a valuable site commercially because it's a great mill site, but it um, it's was not that good of soil even before the interstate came through. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. No, um, as, as you probably know, these household inventories we get at, uh, often when somebody dies. And so in colonial America, those are incredibly rich sources for um, you know, what a person owns at the end of their lives. Um, but he didn't die here, so we don't have an inventory for him. And so as a consequence, nope, it's a mystery. It's frustrating. Where did he die? I wish I knew. <laughs> I know. There's a lot you can't find out. Yeah. This is probably just as well that the students hear this. You're not going to get an answer to every question. Yeah. Sorry. Wish it were not that way. But Kim, thank you. Thank you again. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you.